Just real quick, I, I want us to um, say special prayers this week for Kent as he will go into surgery this Thursday on his back. So let's uh, remember Kent and his family. This morning's lesson is a little, um, a little bit different, um, and you'll see why in just a second. Uh, but sometimes you, you do things just a little bit different in hopes that um, maybe it piques someone's interest, maybe just the title of the lesson, and maybe it will stick with you uh, a little bit longer, a little bit better. Um, and so we're going to talk about, can we learn good lessons from the devil? And I don't want to leave the wrong impression that, you know, there's something good about the devil and we've got to find the good in the devil. No, um, he is the most evil, vilest uh, being there is. Um, but can we learn good lessons from him? We talk about his being evil. I think, you know, as we see what's going on in these cities around our country this weekend, um, we see that Satan's in all of that. Um, he, he is involved in what is going on with these, these looters and the violence that is going on. Um, so I, I don't want you to, to get the impression I'm trying to say there's, there's something good about Satan. But even Jesus talked about good lessons, taught good lessons from bad and evil people. And that's kind of what we're going to deal, deal with um, this morning, because I believe the answer is yes. There are good lessons that we can learn from this very evil being known as the devil, Satan. Um, there's a lesson that I do um, from the book of Job, and it's kind of the same, same theme where uh, I talk about when Satan is right, and that sounds kind of strange, like, well, well, Satan's right. And what it does is it looks at the, the statements of Satan as he talks to God about Job. And what, what the devil says to God about Job, he doesn't just pull this out of, of, of thin air. There's a reason he says what he says to God. For example, he says to God, does Job uh, obey you for nothing? No, uh, Job is faithful to you because you have placed a hedge about him. Because you have given him good things, you have made him wealthy, you have protected him. And I make the point that the devil says that because for a lot of people, that's right. There's a lot of people that simply obey God when things are going good, when, when they see God doing good things for them. But what happens when that's God? Well, the faith, because it's not founded on anything, is destroyed and comes to nothing. But the thing about the devil in the book of, of Job is, even though sometimes he's right, he's wrong because he's talking about those things in regard to Job. And Job did not obey God simply because he put a hedge about him. So in that like theme, we're going to talk about what can we learn good from the devil. And so what's, our, what's the first lesson we can learn? Well, here it is. Number one, he can't make people do anything. He can't take over people's free will. He can't make you do something that you don't want to do. Right? In fact, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 3, if you will. Go over to Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. And this is where we have Satan working uh, on Eve through the serpent. Um, we're already told he is more crafty than the beast of the field. And <clears throat> let's take a look at what he does with Eve here. Verse 4, The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows in the day that you eat from it, the tree, that your eyes will be opened and your life will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and there was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, at no point does Satan ever take over Eve's will and, and, and decision-making power and make her do that. He can't do that. But what he can do is he can tempt. He can suggest. He can influence. He can, with his words, make something that God says is sinful look attractive. Look profitable. Look good. And so that's what he does here. He tries to get her with his words, with his suggestions, that the reason God doesn't want you to eat from this tree is because God doesn't want you to be like him. God is selfish. That's the thought he wants to plan in her mind. And then he wants to also plan in her mind to look at the tree like she's never looked at it before. And so, you'll notice in verse 6, she looks at the tree and she, all of a sudden she says, it is good, the fruit is good, it can make you one wise. And so, by the influence, by the suggestions, by the words of Satan, she takes of the fruit that she's not supposed to take. And her eyes are open. Well, I think that's a good lesson. A good lesson for us. That we need to understand we can't make people do things we want them to do. We cannot control people. But what we can do, like the devil, not tempt, that's not, that's not a word I want to put in here, but we can suggest, we can influence, we can give advice, we can paint a truthful and a righteous picture for people. And that's exactly what we need to be doing. As Satan is out there doing his evil, painting the untruthful picture, we are trying to picture, uh, uh, paint the picture of what? Truthful, logical, spiritual. And, and we have the ability to do that. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and 18, if you will. Here Paul says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Let's stop right there. <laughs> Again, I wasn't intending this to be highlighting what's happening this weekend. But isn't that exactly what's going on? People are trying to pay back evil for evil. And there's absolutely no logic to it. How does it make logical sense to protest against police violence, as they see it, by breaking into a completely innocent business owner's store and to rob from him? But see, Satan has worked on the minds of these people so that that which is illogical to them seems completely logical. The Bible calls that deception. But God teaches us never pay back evil for evil to anyone, but instead respect what is right in the sight of all men, and if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So I want to ask you, why does Paul put in this highlighted, and this is my emphasis, these words highlighted, so far as it depends on you? Because Paul realizes that sometimes you can try to make peace all you want. You can try to be like Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers all you want. And sometimes the result is not peace. Why? Because, as they, the old saying is, it takes two to tangle. And so sometimes the, the other person doesn't seek peace. They're not going to be peaceable. And so, you can try as hard as you want, but you can't control what they're going to do. And so what Paul is saying is what? 
Paul is saying, make sure that you're not part of the unrest. Make sure you're not part of the, the reason there isn't peace. Make sure by your words and your actions, because that's what you can control, you try to make peace. You try to promote righteousness. And so this is a great passage where Paul shows us very clearly that we can't control other people. But so far as it depends on us, this is what we can do. So Satan teaches us that we can't control people. We can't make decisions for them, right? But what I want to do is I want to give you one can't and two cans. One can't and two cans. So here we go. This is what we've been talking about. You can't control what people do. But here's the thing. There's a lot of us that get filled with anxiety, worry, anger, frustration, and you just keep going on. Because we want things to turn out the way we want things to turn out, right? We want everything to be how we want it. But that's not the way the world works. People have free will. And sometimes what we want doesn't get accomplished. We can't control what people do, and yet a lot of times we spend our time getting upset or frustrated or being anxious or being fearful or whatever it might be. And to quote Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, we can't add a single cubit to our life by doing that. It's not profitable. And so let's not try to spend so much time and so much energy and so much negativity in trying to control the outcome by controlling people, which we can't do. And let's focus on what we can do. And so here's the two cans. You can, as we talked about, suggest, give advice, influence, etc., so let's spend our time trying to do that. And the more that we do that, the more likely the chances are, even though we can't make a decision for someone, that they will make the decision that we want them to make. Or more importantly, the decision that God wants them to make. So let's concentrate on what we can do and do that. And notice right away, it's a different outcome. It's a different impact on us, right? If I'm seeking to give advice towards righteousness and peacemaking, that's a much more positive response and action than trying to control people, something I can't do. And the anxiety and the anger that comes out of not being able to do that. So number three, the second can, you can control the way you react. You have power to do that. And so number one, a lot of times the way we react to what we can't do is very negative, is very unchristlike. But number two is very Christ-like, very positive. So how are you going to react to situations that you have no control over well that you have control over and you can make it christ-like you can make it positive you can take that anxiety and, and and throw it on jesus and say god i'm going to trust you and i'm going to put a smile on my face and i'm going to be positive even though things aren't going exactly the way i want them to go I'm going to do what I can do. And so I think that's a good lesson that we learn from Satan. He does what he can for evil. We do what we can for God, for righteousness. All right. The second good lesson we learn from the devil is this. 
and we make this point all the time. The devil is so good at what he does, he will do anything he has to to accomplish what he wants. He will do anything within his power that he can do to bring about the result. So what is he all about? Well, what we learn is the devil is extremely motivated. And, that, and that's the way I want to... He's extremely motiva- motivated to what? <clears throat> Take people away from God. And everything I read in the Bible seems to... That's his main purpose. He wants to keep people away from God. If you're not a Christian... He wants to make sure you never become a Christian. If you are a Christian, He wants to take you away from that. He wants you to fall away. And if He can't do that, right? He can't control what you do. He wants to leave you this impression. He wants you to lead you down this path that you think you're being faithful to God. He, he thinks You think that this is what God wants you to do, but in reality it's not. He wants you to think you're a Christian when you're in reality not a faithful Christian. Think about Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul. As Saul, he thought he was doing right by persecuting Christians. The devil wanted it that way. He knew he couldn't give Saul uh, to give up God. But he led him down this path so that he was doing things against the will of God while thinking he was doing the will of God. Deception. He's extremely motivated to do this. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 13. This is the, um, the time where, where God lets Satan have his best shot at Jesus. Do you realize that, that God... Let Satan go right at Jesus before any of this ministry, before the path to the cross started. That if Satan could be successful, then God's plan of salvation that had been coming for for hundreds of years would be gone. Forty days and forty nights, he tempted Jesus. Jesus conquered every single temptation. But then in chapter 4, verse 13, when the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him, Jesus, until an opportune time. I want you to notice, at this point, he realizes he's defeated and he leaves Jesus. He departs from Jesus, but he's not done. He hasn't given up. He's coming back. Not just at any time, an opportune time. Why? Because he is extremely motivated. And he wants to find the most opportune time to find an opportunity to get you away from God. Even for a moment at first to get you away from God. Because he realizes the more that he can get you away from God, the easier it becomes to be away from God. He's extremely motivated. And so we're learning good lessons from an evil being. You know, um, Jesus in Luke 16 gave a parable that kind of teaches the same thing. Good lessons from an evil man. Go over to Luke chapter 16, if you will. There's a parable there that's kind of difficult for us. Because as you read it, you kind of like, well, that doesn't sound right. But it's the parable of the unrighteous steward. And let me just set it up for you. You've got the steward that is um, embezzling, basically, from his master. He is stealing from his master, who's been so good to him over all these years. And the master finally finds out about it. And he goes to the steward and he says, listen... You're going on trial. And you're going to have to give an account of your stewardship. And if you're found guilty, it's the end for you. Well, he knows he is guilty. He knows he's in trouble here. 
So what's he going to do? Well, he's too proud to beg and he is too old to work. And so what he does is he comes up with a plan to once again steal from his master. And he goes to his master's debtors and says, what do you owe my master? And he says, I owe him 80. He says, hey, you write out 40 and we'll call it good. And he goes to the next and he says, I owe your master 100. He says, hey, write out 60 and we're good. And he does that with all the debtors. And what's he doing? He's doing that. He's saying, hey, at some point when I get fired, I'm going to call in all these favors. And that's how I'm going to survive. Look, if you would, at Luke 16. Here's the reaction of the master when he finds out once again his steward has cheated him out of his profit, of his money. In verse 8, his master praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of of light. So here he finds out that his, his steward has cheated him once again, and what's his reaction? He praises the steward, who is called the unrighteous steward at this point. And we look at that and we say, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Well, what Jesus is doing is he's bringing out a lesson here about motivation. And notice how he adds the, these words, the sons of this age, the unbelievers, the ungodly, the people who are going for physical rewards are more shrewd because they're more motivated. They're more motivated and so they're more wise. They're more shrewd in getting their reward. And Jesus says, in fact, they're more motivated, they're more shrewd than the sons of light, those that are for God, those that are looking for the heavenly reward. And I want to tell you, <clears throat> Jesus looks at the people of his day and he sees that the people that are are unbelievers that aren't doing right for God. Those that are seeking the physical rewards, the men pleasers. As Jesus says again in Sermon Mount, they get their reward in full. They're more motivated than the children of God. I want you to think about that as we look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. He says to these Christians... These sons of light, he says, do you not know that those who run a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Paul must have seen that there were Christians that were running, but they weren't trying to win. He wonders if they were even trying to finish. He says, no, you run in such a way that you're going to win. You be motivated. He says in verse 25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an, uh, an, excuse me, an imperishable. You know, in those days when an athlete won, they put this wreath on the winner's head, Right? It was very prestigious, right? It was the gold medal of those days. But what happens with that wreath? It's like a Christmas tree, right? You get a, a real Christmas tree. After a week or so, it's all dried up and it's dead and you just put it out in the trash. It's perishable. And yet, for a perishable prize... They, they dedicate so much time and so much energy and so much motivation... And what Jesus is saying is we got a better reward. It doesn't end. It doesn't fade. You don't put it out in the trash. When you really look at it, 
the children of God should be so much more motivated, more motivated to be spiritual each and every day a little bit more. Motivated to be more and more like Christ and less and less like the devil. Not to be a friend of this world. So I want to ask you, how's your motivation? I kind of, I kind of wonder if um, with this pandemic and some of the changes that have happened. I wonder if there's some Christians that kind of like it. You don't have to, I don't have to go to church as much. Uh, the, the Bible studies aren't going on anymore. I can spend more time at home doing stuff I want. I, I hope that's not the way we feel. Because... We need to be extremely motivated. And not like Jesus looking at people and saying, I, I, I think the sons of this age are more shrewd and more motivated than God's own people. It's a good lesson. Satan is so motivated for something that is far less than what God promises us. And third and finally, the third good lesson we learn from the devil is this. Satan knows God has all authority. And, and here's the weird thing about that. Sometimes Satan bows to God's authority. He does not try to, to break it. He does not try to, to, to go beyond it. And then sometimes he doesn't. Obviously, he is called the adversary for a reason. Going about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, that is not God's will, but he doesn't care. Does he worship God? No. He doesn't care about that. He breaks that. But then there are times, like in the book of Job, where he comes to God, and they're talking about Job, and God has given Job as a candidate, and he says, okay, uh, let, let's, let's bring out this testing. And so in Job chapter 1, verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. So here God says, Satan, listen, here's what you can do. You can put forth your hand, or you can touch the things of Job, but you can't touch Job. You can't touch his body. You can't take his life. Here's the parameters. And Satan goes out and he follows exactly that. He doesn't say, too bad, I'm going to inflict him. Too bad, I'm going to take his life. And then in chapter 2, after losing the first battle, he comes back to the second battle. And this time, God says very similar, but this time he says, you can touch his body. You can inflict his health, but you can't take his life. And again, Satan follows God's rules. And it's not just Satan, it's his servants that we see demons in Mark chapter 1, verse 24, here comes Jesus encountering this man that is possessed with many demons. Legion is, is his name. Um, and so the demons speak through this, this man they possess to Jesus and said, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And that's kind of the, an incredible thing about these demons who clearly are ruled by Satan, called Beelzebub in that regard. They know who Jesus is. They will confess who Jesus is. And they will obey Jesus. In verse 25 and 26, Jesus cast out the demon. He says to Legion, come out! And guess what? They come out. 
They recognize that Jesus is going to torment and destroy them. He has that authority. But they don't obey God. They don't worship Jesus. It's kind of a weird thing, but Satan knows God has all authority. And so as we end, I I, I want to give you one like and one unlike. Like Satan, we recognize that God has all authority, don't we? But with that comes an incredible perspective and humility. There's this perspective that we have that He's God and we are not. Because let's face it, when we talk about the will of God, the the, the authority that He uses to bring that plan, that will, we may not always understand it. We may not always agree with it. We may not know why or agree with why God has brought us to to this place at this time for this reason. Or He brought us to this person at this time for some reason. I mean, if I was in charge of of things, I I probably wouldn't do it the way God did it. It's, It's hard. But even though I don't understand it or, or, or even agree with it, what? I bow to it. Because I recognize He's God and I'm not. I recognize He has all authority and I don't. I recognize He knows all and I don't. Including what's going to happen in the future. And the only reason I know anything about what's going to happen in the future is because God revealed it to me. Through His Word. So like Satan, we recognize that God has all authority, but unlike Satan, we don't want to reject it sometimes. And that's always been uh, the temptation for the child of God is, is to what? Keep one foot in God's camp and another foot in the world. It's so easy for us to, to look at you know, the New Testament and say, hey, I, I, that's easy. I got that one. I can do that one. I can, and set up Christianity based on things that don't make us change too much. But then there's some things that, I mean, they, they, they would make us really have some life changes. And it's real tempting for us to say, hey, I'll just kind of ignore those. And you know what? The world will allow you to ignore those. And sometimes even your own brethren will let you ignore those. You can't say, hey, love your neighbor as yourself and hate your enemy. You can't make that compromise. Again, Jesus talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't He? You can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. You, you, you can't say, yes, um, I, I see you've got to be an honest person. You can't lie. But fornication, that's okay. We're more open-minded in the world today. We can't reject some of God's Word like Satan does. Especially when we know it all has authority from God. That's that, that's that trying to be complete. Trying to be whole. And so can we learn good lessons from Satan? Yeah, I believe we can. He can't make people do anything he wants. And neither can we. He will do anything He has to to reach His goals. And those goals fall, fall far short of what God is going to give us. Are we like-motivated? 
And Satan knows God has all authority, but sometimes he's willing to just throw that out to do what he wants, to make life easy on him. We don't want to be like that. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope you have a good week. We're going to finish with a song and a prayer. But I want to put out to you, if, if anyone out there is wondering, really, what is God's plan of salvation? Am I really a Christian? I've never really studied that. I just had people tell me things. We want to, we want to sit down and show you God's Word, what His plan of salvation is. And even with COVID-19, if there's someone out there that says, yes, I know what that, that plan of salvation, and, and I know that baptism for the mission of sins is part of that, and you want to be baptized, we'll, we'll put on our mask and gloves and whatever, and we'll baptize you into Christ. Don't be like Satan and turn away from God, even though we can learn good lessons from him. Have a good week. Thank you so much.